all I would say is that um, no one deserves special treatment uh, because they're a friend of the Prime Minister and no one deserves to be pilloried just because they're a friend of the Prime Minister. We cannot have uh, our politics operated by proxy in this way. What do Conservatives believe in? If you made a list, free trade would surely come high up. The idea is that when you reduce barriers and tariffs, trade moves quicker and everyone gets richer. But sometimes it can be tricky to stay true to your principles. The former Cabinet Minister, Liam Fox, says that the government needs to stop protecting the British steel industry. He joins us now. Good morning, Liam. Good morning. Um, what are you specifically concerned about? Because I suppose in, in this world of red walls and levelling up, looking after big industry... And, is something that the government would consider quite important to it? Well, first of all, to correct uh, your introduction, I didn't say we shouldn't protect the British within the rules, the international rules that we have agreed to, uh, not least under the World Trade Organization. Um, what I think the, the problem is, is that uh, it's very easy to get into uh, a, a protectionist mindset that's in breach of our international commitments. And the trouble that you get into when you breach those commitments is that others are entitled under international trading law to take measures against you. And if we start to say, well, we don't have the evidential basis uh, and we're not within the rules of making certain restrictions from certain countries on steel, they will take measures against us. Now, if you take big countries that export steel to us like uh, South Korea, uh, it's very predictable that they will start to take measures against us where it hurts politically or on things like Scotch whiskey, uh, on things like cashmere and things like folding bikes. You, you, the list can be quite long. And of course, as we know from the trade dispute between the United States and Europe um, uh, well, a few years ago, uh, those sanctions are likely to come in areas that hurt the most to the governing political party. So while protectionism is quite alluring in the short term, it actually leads to bigger problems later on in other sections of the economy and to consumers across the board. But other countries that you mention will use, they'll subsidise steel in their countries and then dump it onto our market. That's the fear, isn't it? And that, that, that then gives us cheap steel and then our industry can't compete with that. Well, dumping is illegal and we would be entirely legally uh, in, in line with WTO to put tariffs up against that. Uh, so dumping is illegal, illegal subsidy, of course, something else that's not allowed. Uh, and there are measures in place to stop that. What you're not allowed to do is simply to say, um, these are genuinely competitively produced steels elsewhere, but we're not going to allow them into the country because our industry uh, can't compete in, in some areas. And there are ways in which we can help the steel industry. Uh, if you look at the prices that the uh, major electricity consumers in the industry are paying, uh, as a result of the green steel, for example, in this country, the median price for electricity being paid by the British steel industry was about 84% above the EU median. Uh, that's where we can actually help, and that's entirely within international rules. It's entirely within our rights to do so. Uh, and the first thing that the government should do is to remove from the steel industry the excessive cost that it's carrying in the UK, which are not being carried by our competitors, rather than getting us into an unnecessary international trade dispute where we will undoubtedly be the losers. Do you think this is a government, you, this is a Conservative government that's become sort of oddly addicted to interventionism, that effectively it feels it's constantly being asked to, to solve problems which historically markets would have sought to, to control, at least historically in a, in a Conservative government, they would, would, would leave up to markets to deal with? Well, the trouble is that we've distorted the market by some of the green tariffs that we've introduced uh, we've made some of our own industry uncompetitive. We have to deal with that first. Uh, absolutely, we must deal with the climate issues, um, but we must do it in a way that doesn't leave British industry uh, unfairly disadvantaged. I think that's also true when we look at things like carbon pricing. As you know, despite the fact that I, I'm a complete free trader, I do think there are things like uh, carbon pricing of goods from China, for example, where they're using uh, highly polluting techniques to produce manufactured goods that then undercut us. I think there are ways to deal with that. And there are ways to do that within, within the rules under which we operate. And we either believe in an international rules-based system or we don't, not just on the days that it suits us. Well, some people would say that the, the, this government has shown that it doesn't always believe in an international rules-based system when you look at things like the Northern Ireland Protocol. Well, the, there are arguments around the protocol, I think, about uh, legality. I actually think that the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and the disputes around it are unnecessary because in a trade sense, uh, we could deal with the potential leakage into the single market 
by other mechanisms such as mutual enforcement, where we could have a, a penalty on those who would export into the European Union that breached their standards or their rules of origin. That's entirely, uh, in terms of trade, solvable. It seems that the protocol is much more caught up in the European Union's uh, wish to punish Britain for voting for Brexit, but I don't want to get into that. I think that it's important in trade uh, that we maintain a rules-based system because in recent years we've seen a rise in protectionism and that is hitting very hard the developing countries. And that protectionism has risen from the G20, the richest countries in the world. At the end of the financial crisis, less than 1% of all the imports coming into the G20 were covered by tariffs or non-tariff measures. That's now over 10%. That's making it very difficult for countries to trade their way out of poverty. And one of the reasons, as you alluded to at the beginning, that I believe in free trade is that it's one of the ways in which we've taken more people out of poverty globally in the last generation than ever before. And what we can't afford to happen is to see that process go into reverse. The, the effects of Putin uh, from the report announced yesterday were that we're pushing another 100 to 150 million people uh, into poverty, into food poverty. Uh, we need to do what we can to keep the international trading system open. Just before you go, uh, Liam Fox, you're a very experienced Westminster politician. Um, obviously, the scandal around Chris Pincher has been occupying many people's minds. Do you think it was a mistake, perhaps in retrospect, but maybe even at the time, for Boris Johnson to appoint as a, as Deputy Chief Whip someone who he'd already made jokes about as Hansi, someone uh, in regard to whom there was rumours circulating of inappropriate behaviour? Well, over the weekend, I've seen a great deal of hearsay. Sources close to, and somebody close to said, you know, I think we need to be above um, tittle-tattle and gossip at Westminster. All I would say is that um, no one deserves special treatment uh, because they're a friend of the Prime Minister and no one deserves to be pilloried just because they're a friend of the Prime Minister. We cannot have uh, our politics operated by proxy in this way. Liam Fox, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. That's Liam Fox there, the former Cabinet Minister.